First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes, and I want to welcome you to Wednesday Word. Hey, it's so good to be with you uh, tonight, and I want to thank you for joining. And uh, man, if you are watching online and you're in the area, we would love to have you come out and join us for a Sunday, because if you think this is good online, you ought to experience it live. And uh, I hope you will do that. Uh, we have been talking about what is truth. And this matters because what you see is truth is what is going to shape uh, your life. And um, I have had, uh, I want to say a couple of weeks ago, but it's probably truthfully been a couple of months, um, a word that has just set in my gut and, and I have not been able um, to shake it. And, um, and since then, I've heard other people use it. I feel like I'm watching it happen um, where spiritual pours over into the physical that I have felt like God is saying there's going to be a shifting. And, and uh, you know, even now it kind of just resonates, you know, in my gut that there was a season that the current was going out and now we're in a season that the current is trickling in. And, and I'm watching things shift. I'm watching lives turn. I'm watching... Um, people who uh, were maybe not open or willing to address some things begin to address some things. And, and, and I love what God is doing, you know, in our church and in our, our church family um, right now. And uh, there are things. I, I, I think our theme for the year is, is listen to his voice. Um, and I think that is just so foundational in what God is wanting to do in us and through us all. Um, that as we listen to the voice of God, that there are going to be things that shift. That as we listen to the voice of God, uh, there are going to be things that shift in other people's lives. And God is going to use us to be a part of that. That, that as I listen for Him and obey Him, that in my own life, in the context of my own person and spiritual growth and development, that that God's going to shift some things uh, for me and, and for you. And, and so I want you to take this personal, um, and, but I also want you to understand that it's part of a greater call on the church of God, um, that we are to listen for His voice and be obedient um, because God wants to do something in you, but also God wants to use you to do something in somebody else. <coughs> and so... I hope you'll just take that and put that in your pocket and, and keep that with you. But we have been looking at Sermon on the Mount, and it's such an incredible uh, message. And it is, in so many ways, uh, Jesus saying this. Guys, you have thought like that. That has been how you were taught to think, showed to think, lived out in front of you. But I am telling you, let's think like this. And he's just challenging us to look at things differently. And, and in doing so, frees us. In doing so, kind of takes the shackles off of our hands that we are not limited and bound to the old way of thinking that God has a new thing. And we are able to, to do that. Uh, poor in spirit, you know, what does that do? It has nothing to do with wealth or what one has, but rather understanding that within ourselves, we can't do it alone, that we need God in our lives. That God will bless those that realize that, that unless he gives grace, unless he gives mercy, unless he opens the door, the door's not going to open and, and we are not going to be okay. You know, we need God. I cannot do it alone. We looked at God saying, blessed are those that mourn for they shall be comforted. And, and how we don't even like that word mourn. Uh, you know, it's just, it's the struggle. It sounds like struggle. And, you know, we, we don't want to deal with it or if we have to as short as possible because we live in an entertainment world and, and we're not used to digging down on why I feel how I feel and what's going on inside of me. We just try to numb out and move past it and think we've addressed things. But mourning is far more than we think uh, it is because to mourn is to feel sorrow for something. Uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 8-10 through 10, ties the sorrow to the will of God rather than the circumstance of the world and saying that it is this, sorrow uh, that leads us to repentance. And the only thing that you and I really need to repent for is sin. Um, and so when Jesus is talking about mourning, he's talking about people who have sorrow 
uh, or mourn over the presence of sin at work in them or operating in their lives. You know, blessed are those who are sad to the point of going to God and repenting because of the presence and the impact of sin in their lives. Uh, he's not talking about sorrow created by the consequence. Uh, he, he's not talking about we're mourning because we got caught. Um, he's talking about I mourn because I realize that with my actions or my thoughts or my lack of action that I have hurt the heart of God. It's not even about what I did, just that I did anything. Um, I don't want to hurt the heart of God. I want to honor the heart of God. You know, sin is like garbage, and if you keep it in the house, it's going to stink. Uh, it always does. It's going to collect critters. It's going to collect odors, and, uh, and, and, and it's amazing. And so when I open my life up to sin, uh, and then I don't address it, and I engage, I practice it, um, knowing that the Holy Spirit dwells within me, you know, I'm kind of asking God to get used to the smell and get used to the stink and get used to the critters and get used to the unclean things. God, I don't want you to leave because I love you, but I also don't want to get rid of these things because I love them as well. And, and you know, God, can you live in my garbage? That's, that's kind of what we're saying. And uh, it's always amazing to me why it's easier to ask God to live in our garbage than it is to address the mess and, and be made whole and be made clean. Um, you know, that's what we can do. You have the power uh, to do that through Christ that lives within you. And so when he says, blessed are they that mourn, uh, the blessed are they that have an inner anguish over the sin that we've allowed in our lives. And so I mourn uh, in what I see in the world, okay? Now, I've settled my heart to be a light and to pray and, and to pray for a move of God that changes other lives. I, I mourn, um, you know, the sin that I see in the lives of those that I love because I love them. I care for them. I know that wherever there is sin, there's a cost and a price. There's something being killed, stolen, you know, uh, or destroyed. That's, that's what sin does. You know, I mourn the things that are in my life that maybe are not honoring of God. And so I understand that I'm in the process of sanctification, that when I know Him as Lord and Savior, I am saved. But as I walk with Him, I continue to be changed. Uh, and, and so I thank God that I'm changed but I thank God that I continue to be changed. And as we work towards becoming more and more like him, you know, I mourn because I know what sin does to the heart of God. And, and I rejoice uh, because I know what God has done in my life. You know, thank God for his faithfulness. Thank God for his grace and mercy. And so we don't have to go through lives making excuses for our lives, making excuses for things um, because we can be changed. We can be made whole. We can be healed. We can break loose of sins that have held us, you know, captive. And that's what Paul said. I was a slave to it. We can be set free because God is greater than anything that we face. But if the things, this is what I've said, if the things that break the heart of God don't break mine, um, then I feel like I have to kind of step back and look at my relationship with God and say, why? You know, why, why am I okay with God's heart being broken because of something? And I look at it and go, eh, you know, um, I need to know his heart more. And so it's important that we abide. Um, and that's it. As I live with God, walk with God, as I, you know, read his word, not just to check the box of I did my devotions, but I read his word to know him more. That's abiding, walking in his presence. Galatians 5, walk in the spirit, living that practically. It's like a, a parent teaching, you know, a, a child, you know, kids don't always know what's good or bad for them. You know, you tell your children, be careful around a hot stove because you don't want them to be burned. You want to teach them that. Now, they can still learn that whether you teach it or not, uh, but usually it's learned more painfully. Usually it's because they touch something hot and they learn and get a blister and a burn on their hand and then they've learned, oh, don't touch the stove. And so there are lessons our kids will still learn uh, that we don't teach them, but it tends to be more painful. And so I think it's true of, of our walks with God. There are things I can learn by abiding with Him that God says, no, let's, let's steer here, let's do this, let's love this way, let's serve this way. Uh, or I can go out and try to do it on my own and have painful experiences and learn that way God's way is the best way. Um, and, and so abiding is always better. You know, there's so much stuff that flows out of us uh, and into us 
that only comes from abiding with Christ, walking with Him. And so because God is a holy God and He doesn't want us to sit in our garbage, He says, blessed are those who mourn. You know, they mourn over sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is, just that the sin is, uh, that it took place. And so people who are close to God are people who mourn. Uh, you know, not only because of what it does to the heart of God, but what it does to those who are close around us because sin doesn't just affect us. Uh, it affects people that are in a close proximity, you know, to us. And so wrote, mourning is the doorway closer to the heart of God. So to fail to mourn is to walk the path that will just harden your heart. Um, and, and as I harden my heart, we become less sensitive to the leading of God. We become less sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, uh, to the things that are contrary in my life. And, and with a hard heart, I don't love right. I don't love myself the way that I should. Um, I, and I, I think that affects us living the two things that Jesus said were most important. Love me with your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor you know, as yourself. And so, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's what it says. So, um, blessed are those, yeah, I love it, who live with a heart sensitive enough to hurt over sin. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.2 says it's better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so living should take this to heart. You know, at a funeral, you know, it may not be as much fun, but you're thinking about things that really matter. And at a party, we're often camouflaging uh, what truly matters and the most important things just to have fun. And so there are things that we need to look at in our lives. You know, you've heard me say it before, be a student of yourself. Um, you know, evaluate, consider how you use your time and your opportunities. You know, uh, in Psalms 32, 3 to 5 says, When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me, and all my guilt was gone. Um, this is talking about David. And, you know, when David didn't address the sin, when he just tried to hide it and tried to cover it up and tried, you know, just to, to push it behind him and just move on, he was restless. But when he did it biblically, all right, confess, repent, and turn, um, all of his guilt was gone. I mean, it was just like the heaviness of all that was lifted because his heart mourned and he was able to shift and turn and be right with the Lord. And so blessed are we when we recognize our sin. You know, blessed are we uh, when I confess and I see it and call it for what it is, you know, in my life and restore the relationship with God, I'll be comforted as well. All right. Uh, tonight, what I want to touch on is Matthew 5.5. 5. We're still in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And it says this, blessed are the meek for they will inherit uh, the earth. Now, other translations will use uh, words like humble or gentle, and I'm going to you know, intertwine those as we move forward. But we don't really like those words because I don't think we really like the definitions uh, that we accept for them, you know, because I don't want to be meek or gentle because in my head, meek sounds weak. Uh, in my head, it just means that just don't speak up, don't share your mind. Don't, do, you know, stand up for yourself. You don't have a voice. You have to be agreeable with everything because you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to cause any problems. And, and you know, and, and in that, I kind of feel like I do have a voice. And I, and I think that what I feel and think and what I feel God's saying does matter in my home, in my life, in my church. And so meekness sometimes, uh, I don't think we understand it well because what it actually means is this, to live with power under control. Um to live with power under control. And so when Jesus is telling the disciples this and teaching this, uh, the Jews were living under Roman control. They were oppressed, and, and the Jewish people wanted nothing more than to come out from underneath Roman rule, and they wanted freedom. They wanted to be set free. And so Tony Evans, he writes about the trial of Jesus where he stood before Pilate, and Pilate offered uh, to the crowds Jesus and Barabbas. Now, one would be set free, and you know the story. They chose Barabbas, and part of the reason that they chose Barabbas was that he was a zealot. He was a group of insurgents. He was someone who was openly, actively fighting against the Roman rule that was over them, and they were trying to overthrow 
the Roman uh, military and, and power. And so the spiritual leaders hated Jesus because he didn't follow their rules and they had worked so hard to create all these rules and all these things. And Jesus shows up and takes all of it and says, love God and love your neighbor. Uh, and they had a hard time with that. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And as scripture says that they begin to conspire against him in John 12. And the spiritual leaders didn't just want to kill Jesus who had done this miracle, but they wanted to kill Lazarus who was the evidence of the miracle. And, and I think this is something for us to keep is that, listen, not only does Satan want to destroy the work of God in you, he wants to destroy you because you're evidence of the work of God. And so we are in spiritual battles. We are in these things. You know, he, Lazarus was the evidence of God's power. And so the crowds follow Jesus. Actually, at one point, John 6, 15, they tried to forcibly take him and make him to be king. And, and, and what they didn't vote for was the way that he did it because Jesus was being, Jesus escapes through. He's like, I'm not here to be king. I'm here to be savior. I'm not here to address Romans. I'm here to address sin. Um, and, and they just had such a hard time dealing with that. You know, God, God, you're my God and you got to fix my, my stuff. And God's like, I'm here to fix your heart. I'm not here always to fix stuff. I'm here to fix your heart and your spirit. And so they didn't pick Jesus because he's too meek. He was too gentle. He was too quiet. Barabbas. He'd go out and fight somebody. He, he would do that. Barabbas, they wanted power unleashed, not power under control. And that looked more like Barabbas. And so they thought Barabbas was more hope to them than Jesus was. So they set him free and crucified Jesus. Um, for power to be effective, it really has to be under control. I mean, I, I would not want to go to a doctor to receive radiation and have him just aim it at my whole body. You know, I want him to aim specifically. Hone it in. You know, you got power to do stuff, but let's not be careless. Focus it in on the area of need. You know, unleashed power without wisdom rarely accomplishes the desired outcome. All right. The Jews looked at meekness and the gentleness of Jesus as weakness and not strength. Uh, the Greek word uh, for uh, meek uh, or gentle is, is praos, and, and it's a word about balancing power and avoiding harshness. Um, and they used it um, almost describing domestic animals. Like you, you can take an a ox and hook it up to a, a, you know, a plow and, and it's power, but it's controlled and you can plow a field. Uh, you can go to the zoo, you know, and they have an elephant. You know, elephant wants to run, it's gonna run. Not much is gonna stop it, but they train it to have control. Uh, over its power. They don't take the power away from it, but they teach it control. Uh, you know, a horse has to be broken to be ridden, but once it's broken, it's power that's harnessed. It's power that's focused. And so gentleness is not really, meekness is not really about a loss of power. It's not you becoming less. Uh, it is about controlling it and using it well in a way that honors God. True greatness requires gentleness and strength under control because if I cannot bring my own thoughts under control, if I can't bring my own words under control, uh, if I can't bring my own actions under control, then I can't really live up to my full potential because God calls us to be meek and God calls us to be gentle and that is power under control. And so uh, if anyone's ever been around somebody who gets mad quickly, you know, the anger around them reflects the anger within them. Uh, and you, you see this uh, at work. Uh, it's amazing. Strength under control. Uh, Proverbs 25, 28 says, A person without self-control is like a city with a broken down wall. Uh, gentleness or meekness doesn't mean you have to submit to everyone and everything. It is about submitting and yielding to the right things. All right? Real authority, which is God in our lives. And so the goal is to bring all that I do all that I think and all that I say under the rule of Christ in me. God, I don't want to say something that you don't want me to say. God, I don't want to do something that you don't want me to do. And you're like, Pastor Wes, that's just kind of crazy. I mean, how do you live like that? But isn't that what Jesus said? I only say what my Father tells me to say, and I only do what my Father says to do. And if my life is to be like Him, then that's got to be the goal of my life. Um, you know, not just influenced by God, 
there's a lot of people that I think, you know, hey, I love God and I always take what God says under consideration. You know, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about living under the rule uh, of God. And I think one of the toughest things, you know, I've been in ministry now, you know, 22 years here and 11 years in Hagerstown. Um, one of the hardest things is to get people to submit to God. Um, you would be amazing how challenging it could be. You know, when you look at someone and say, this is what the Bible says, and they go, yeah, but this is what I'm thinking. And it's, it's just like, it's, it's challenging to get people to say, I have to lay me down so that Christ is increased you know, in me. You can tell people what the scripture says, dealing with whatever they're facing, but if they don't submit to it, it doesn't always have impact in their lives. You can tell somebody, this is what scripture says, and I think this is what you need to walk out. And then they come back and they're asking, you know, questions about the same problem. And I go, well, did we, did we do that? Well, no, but they want a different answer, but that's still the same answer. You know, uh, and when we live, because ultimately, if you peel all the funness out of that, it's just a rebellious spirit. Our spirit does not want to submit to the spirit of God. And when you peel all that back, there's a rebellious spirit within us that wars the spirit of God in us uh, as well. So humility and surrender bring calm. And without those things, it's chaos. Uh, gentleness and meekness bring a strength far more needed than you realize and without it is, 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 is trouble and struggle. Uh, James 1.21 says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Uh, see, when we bow before God, we can stand among giants. Um, we live in a world that seems like it's lost all self-control. I mean, watch the news. Look at our college campuses. I mean, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, you know, look at, at, at the stores being looted and people being attacked. And, you know, a couple of months ago, one of our own uh, went to Walmart. My wife ran into the store to grab something real quick, and, and he was carjacked, or they tried to carjack him. And, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, people have lost self-control or chosen not to control their own lives. And again, that is uncontrolled strength. Living your life with meekness or gentleness translates into living your life with the value of self-control. And you can't have one without the other. You know, when we surrender to Christ, we're surrendering our gifts and our talents and our personal strength under the authority of God. You know, in the kingdom of God, there's only one king, and it's not you or me. It's him. All right. And most of the struggle that we face, most of the chaos, I think, in our lives that we deal with at times are because of a lack of self-control uh, or there hasn't been a surrender to God. You know, I'm, I'm trying to break from his way to do my way. And there's always a consequence with that. And so meekness is not weakness. Uh, uncontrolled anger, uncontrolled passion, uncontrolled sin, that's the weakness. That's not why I, it's me and I make my own choices. Oh, that's what we lie to ourselves about. But it's out of control and, it, and it's weak. Uh, it's weak. All right. Matthew 5.5 5 says, Blessed are the gentle for they will inherit the earth. Well, what does it mean to inherit the earth? You know, uh, you can look at Psalms 37 and where it references inheriting the earth and receiving the blessings of God's provisions. But he also warns us, and, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to read Psalm 37. He says, listen, don't be frustrated when it looks like evil's winning. That's what God is saying. He said, guys, there's going to be times in your life that you're doing it right and other people are doing it wrong and it looks like they're winning. He says, you have to trust they're not winning, and I'm in control, not them. And it, it's actually an amazing chapter, and I hope that you will take the time. That when we're done, you know, tonight, after I let you go, grab your Bible, open up your phone, Psalms 37. Take some time and read that and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You know, when Jesus tells people in the New Testament they don't inherit the earth, they know what he's talking about. Um, do you know that the first generation that came out of Egypt never made it to the promised land? You know, they, they got out of Egypt, they got into the wilderness, they went, you know, I think so many days to the, to the, to the border, 
uh, could have crossed, but they didn't. God said, go in and conquer. And they sent spies and came back and said, man, there's giants out there. We can't beat them. And they wouldn't listen to God. And because they wouldn't listen to the leadership of God and Moses in their lives, they ended up carving an idol and worshiping it out in the wilderness. And everyone who did that passed away before the next generation was able to be raised up and enter in. Numbers 32, 11 says, Of all those I rescued from Egypt, no one who is 20 years old or older will ever see the land I swore to give Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for they have not obeyed me wholeheartedly. That's, that's tough. I think this is something God's serious about because they wouldn't be humble and they wouldn't be meek and they wouldn't be gentle and they wouldn't surrender and submit. And so they kind of got cut from the will. God's like, I brought you out to give you this. And because you won't obey, because you aren't submitting to the rule of God in your life, um, guys, you're going to miss out on it. You're going to miss out on it. Now, we have all been blessed, and God has determined it. And Ephesians 3, 1 says, Praise be to God, then the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So God already, for your life and for my life, has everything that He's going to do set in place ahead of us. It it is as I obey Him and move at His speed that I hit these things. But when I disobey, I miss them. Uh, When I disobey, I miss moments and opportunities that may or may not ever come back. Ephesians uh, 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God's got it all set up. And when I obey, when I listen to His voice and I obey, I can experience these things. And if I don't, we can miss them. Uh, I'll say that, and sometimes people are surprised at that, that, you know, hey, God will like, he'll still do it, right? I mean, like, if I, I if I was supposed to be over there and saying that, but I ended up over there saying this, God's going to, like, still bless me with what he was going to give me over here. He'll just bless me over there. Right, Pastor West? Yeah, what does God owe you? You know, we act like God owes us something. I I don't, I don't think he owes us something, you know. I, I know this, that when I obey and listen and obey, I can and will receive everything that God has for me. I know that. But when I disobey, I, you know, God doesn't owe me that. Uh, you know, go, go. it's like telling your boss, hey, I'm, I don't want to do the job, but I still want to get a paycheck. I mean, you're cool with that, right? Um, no, sometimes it's obedience that leads to blessing. And I don't bribe obedience in our home. I bless obedience. And and those are different things. So there can be some things that I've waited for years for that God has prepared for me, prayed for years to receive that God wants to give me. But if I don't walk, live humbly, gently in a way that moves me in obedience, it can actually keep me from the very thing that I long for the most. And so the struggle is, is, yeah, I, I think there are things we leave on the table. There are. You know, uh, and so often the enemy for us isn't external, it's internal, it's my mind or my heart, you know, and it's dynamics that look like this. Listen, I love God here, 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 and here, but I kind of reserve this part of my life for me. I trust God here, 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 and here, but you know what? I feel like I got to make it happen over here if it's going to happen, um, you know, but the, the, here's the thing I got to go to the right place to get the right thing. You know, guys, you want a better marriage? you got to do the right things to get to the right things. Uh, you want a better career path? You want more joy? you got to go to the right place to get the right stuff. You know, I can't take a withdrawal slip from Burke and Herbert and then go over to Wells Fargo uh, and, and, and try to take money out there. It, it just doesn't work. you you got to have the stuff at the right place. Um, you know, Tony Evans, in one of his books, talks about all of his kids are in his will, and he's already designated who gets what. But this is kind of funny. Um, but he has a clause at this. If one of his kids starts, and I quote, acting a fool, they lose the inheritance, uh, his, uh, his, his will, so he has set the standards. Um, and it's simply this. He's not talking about having a rough time because that's a part of life, but if they adopt and embrace an ungodly, unrepentant lifestyle that is clearly evident to those that are around them, they can lose their inheritance that he had set apart 
for them because he does not want to be financing a lifestyle in which they're wasting what God uh, has given them. What do you think about that? Uh, that's kind of interesting. You know, but the thing is this, if you're living in alignment with God's kingdom values, then I think what God has set in place for us in our future, we will find and embrace and experience uh, his blessing, his provision, his purpose. I don't have to fight for it necessarily as much as I fight through or, you know, obedience. I don't have to go out and fight to, to be worthy of it. God's already established it. And it's as I, God says, if you're going to obey me, you're going to go here to here to here to here to here. And I've put things in place. And as you move in obedience, you're going to find things come to your life. Um, and, and so all flesh, you know, all this flesh, you know, I do it myself. I, I, I want mentality costs us more than we think. Um, I can do it on my own. We can't. We need God. We need God. I've got to listen to his voice and I've got to obey. You know, he says this, never be envious of the wicked. Psalm 73, for they're on a slippery slope. It says they look like they're winning, but they're not winning. Uh, it might look like it, but don't be deceived. He says in Matthew uh, 6.33, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. Uh, it is incredible to watch God work things out. It, it is amazing when, oh my gosh, we put so much stress and work on ourselves trying to make things happen. And if God says not yet, it doesn't matter what you do. But the minute God says now's the time, you couldn't stop it. And you watch God works things out, and it's amazing. The things you tried to make happen and couldn't, but in His time, it's just like it's a God thing, and you just have to tip your hat and say it's a God thing. And so there are some people that don't experience that because that belongs to those who humble themselves under God. All right? Again, meek is not weak. Uh, I'll close with this. In Numbers 12, Moses is considered to be one of the greatest examples of meekness. And there's this wild story uh, concerning Moses, Aaron, and, and Miriam. Moses had married a Cushite woman, and Miriam and Aaron weren't happy about it. And they talked to him about it and others about it, and they confronted him. And, man, they just threw him under the bus. And, and Moses went to God and God defended Moses. I'm going to read verses 4 to 11, number 12, 4 to 11. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, said, Go to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, Now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? And the Lord was angry with them and he departed. And as the cloud moved from the tabernacle, there stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy. And when Aaron saw what had happened to her, he cried out to Moses, Oh, master, please don't punish us for the sin we have so foolishly committed. Listen. Meek people will fight for others. They don't have to fight for themselves because God does that. And when I live with a humility and when I live with a gentleness that we're called to, I invite God into every matter of my life. And God is your defender. <coughs> and God is your hope. And God is your strength. And so be encouraged today. Let's walk and controlled power and be meek and be humble. First Assembly, I love you and I bless you and I pray that you have a great week. I encourage you, go read Psalms 37. It is a great, great, just a beautiful chapter that will just speak to your heart and I pray that you did that. And make sure that this week you tell somebody about Jesus.